pretty uh pretty comedic sequence that has Boba Fett speaking a mix of Tuscan and sign language uh and you know uh uh basic isn't it basic is the star is the Star Wars language right basically yeah it's, it's right. called operash but it's it's, it's colloquially called, 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 called basic but yes. right that's what i remember from uh, star wars role play folks right so <laughs> and roddy cat knows the uh the, the 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 technical word for it but ultimately uh boba fett is successful in teaching um this ragtag group of uh no pun intended since that's what they are wearing rags this ragtag group of tuscans how to ride these speeders and to set up a heist a heist of this speeding uh, maglev train, basically. Right. So yeah. So Bubba said, "Like, I'll teach you to ride. We're gonna take this train. We're gonna take him out. You know, um, we can go ahead and say that this is. If you are familiar with the movie Lawrence of Arabia, that's it. And uh, as uh, Agent Seven said, Fast Five when they do the the train heist. Uh, right. Similar to, the, to 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 those. Um. Uh, right. So I I jokingly dubbed this episode Boba Fast Five, <laughs> but uh, you know uh, uh, you know feel free to let us know you know in you know in, on our social medias or in the comment section of the of the podcast uh, what you think of this episode and especially what you think of uh, what we've dubbed it as. So um, ultimately. It you know the uh, the Tuscans and Boba Fett are successful in taking down the train after a pretty exciting sequence. Yeah, and uh, and you know what's funny is that the 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 engine of the train or the turbo engine of the train, let's say, not the not the maglev part of the train, but the turbo the 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 forward propulsion of the train in the uh, concept art is mounted on top of the train and is essentially one of the thrusters on the pod racers from episode one. Yep. You know, imagine, imagine, you know, just think of uh, the, the pod racer engines that, that uh, Anakin had uh, put one of those on top of the train and watch that go. So what we find out is that the train is one of the pikes and if you're not familiar with the Pikes, you may want to catch up on Rebels and or Clone Wars. Indeed. And the and the Pikes are in charge of lots of smuggling, and they actually tend to specialize in smuggling spice, kind of the same stuff that's in Dune. I've I've never actually read or watched Dune, but I know that spice is a thing. Pretty much. It, well. So yes, the short order yes, because yeah, I think spice might be slightly different in Dune, but pretty much similar. Like it, I think it is some sort of a drug, but I think there's mm -hmm. supposedly supposedly some difference. But they're both drugs, just right. Right. So the Pikes are smuggling spice, and uh, you know, and and they are actually asked that directly by Boba Fett, and they lie. But the Tuscans, as they are looting the train, discover their load of spice. So they're obviously lying, and, uh, and Boba Fett lets low. the survivors of the of the of the heist live, on the condition they go back to their masters and tell them that any shipments of spice that travel across this area of Tatooine, otherwise known as the Great Dune Sea, must be accompanied by a toll paid to the Tuscan Raiders. Mm -hmm. And it's worth noting that the only reason why the Pikes did this is because Jabba's dead. And because if cause Jabba, Jabba wasn't dead, this would never happen. Right. They wouldn't be intruding on this territory. Right. So, um, so yeah. So, uh, like Agent 70 said, the, the Tuscans are looting train. They, uh, they, they open up the water car. They send the, uh, the Pikes into good underwear, single file towards uh, Anchorhead. Um, and hopefully they'll make it make it there by uh, sundown if they if they start then, um, and then we go back to the tribe it's victorious where uh, Boba uh, starts his ritual to be um, to be uh, accepted fully by the tribe. He gets um, he basically goes on this sp uh, spirit journey thanks to uh, some spice. And this lizard that he sucks up his nose, uh, or excuse me, this gift that the uh, I guess the, the the chief gives him 
that uh, goes up his nose and then he blows spice at him and he starts tripping out, tripping balls. Um, and in this uh, vision quest, wh what have you, he sees um, visions of Camino when he was little. He sees uh, Jango's the slave, well, excuse me, the, the, the fire spray, now called fire spray, uh, leaving Camino. We see this big tree that uh, that uh, Boba Gunna goes towards, which is, I guess, is supposed to be significant of uh, like a family tree or something or some kind of tree. We see eyes in the tree, um, and Boba gets caught up in that said tree and breaks off a branch. We also see, like I said, him. Um, they kind of intersperse him, like drowning in him in the Salak pit. So we kind of go back to that a little bit, and I believe we also see. Uh, Little Boba picking up uh, Jango's helmet uh, from Episode Two when after he died, so all of that kind of, kind of, kind of came together uh, into this uh, into this um, sp spirit journey. He breaks off a, a piece of the tree, and then we see him walking um, walking back to the uh, Tuscan camp, where he basically gets um, he gets uh, some not ceremonial robes, but he basically gets the 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 uh, the, the traditional garb of um, of the Tuscan Raiders, and he also takes this stick and gets it made into a gaffy stick of his own, and we see the process of this, and uh, and last thing we see is um, this uh, last ritual of um, uh, Boba Fett and this group um, around the fire are doing this uh, ritual dance, I guess completing his uh, completing his um, his um, you know his um journey i guess with the the uh right. Tuscan Ranger, raiders and the, the, their acceptance of him right so it's funny that you know all told in episodes of the mandalorian and now in the book of boba fett we're just seeing different sides of several characters and races and, and and groups of characters that we had only seen say a very one-dimensional portrayal of before and i'm speaking mainly of the tuscan raiders right and it's very interesting that we've gotten to see them really cast as the you know the equivalent of natives they are natives they are the natives of tatooine and it is all of these off-worlders with their machines that have made their way to Tatooine for whatever reason and have displaced the um, the original natives of Tatooine, the Tuscans, and made them out to be um, savages and uh and 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 up to no good you know like up to no good nicks because at the end of the day they are less technologically advanced and uh are essentially powerless before the giant machines right. and i kind of wonder if now forgive me for not remembering all of my star wars lore but are the jawas off-worlders too no, I believe they are native. Well, so I feel like we have seen Jawas in other places, but I want to say they're native to Tatooine. So I don't. I'm to not, the I'm Googles. Not, yeah. To the Googles. Oh, actually, that speaking of some speaking of um, <laughs> Star Wars, um, something got brought up that um probably shouldn't, probably wouldn't be appropriate, um. In under normal circumstances, uh, but oh wait, hold on. So so no, ahead, so at least according to Wikipedia, yes, or the Star Wars fandom, yes, uh, Jawas are native to the Outer Rim Desert world of Tatooine, but those who have migrated from Tatooine are referred to as off-world Jawas. Okay, that's what I thought. So, which makes me you know because I because I'm thinking well, there are some native uh, Tatooine characters. Uh, you know, a race of characters who have big machines, and those are the Jawas. Right. So it's kind of, I guess there's, you know, there's there's more than one group of uh, native, uh, a native uh, species to Tatooine. So well, and you got to think about like, has big machines. Right, and you think about it like Jawas are basically scavenger traders. So I guess at mm -hmm. some point that you know, especially when they're they're rolling around with their crawlers and whatnot. So I get, and we like I said, we have seen them off world, so it makes sense that they would try to kind of be in other places so they could uh, further their scavenging trading 
situation. Right. right, but it's no it's just not something that we see Tuscans doing. Correct. So yeah, so that so it, it, there's something to it. Uh, like I said, the bit of trivia, other bit of trivia comes comes about. Like this has really nothing to do with it, but I'm bringing it up because like this is I forgot about this and this is so silly. Um, so when back when we were at the um at the cantina, uh, Garza's place, Max Rebo and then was playing. We know, uh, the the music and this is Star Wars canon. It's called Jizz. Oh. Yeah, I heard that. That's yeah. funny. And I forgot about that. I was like, damn you, Lucas. What is <laughs> and that is canon. You can look that up. So I didn't so despite anything you else might want to think of that or or you think of that as that's kind of what it's called. Yep. Yeah. So anyway, that being said, like I said, the uh, the episode had wrapped up already because we like said we got um Boba's ex- um uh, ex- was, you know, accepted into the Tuscan Raiders clan and kind of given gave them you know, a uh, a leg up in the power in the tribal struggle, well, in the power struggle of, well, such as it is in Tatooine, like they are pretty much, you know, they are in a better place. They're starting to be in a better place than they were in the past, and we've gotten a lot more. We know them a lot more, a lot more about them than we did from the movies and other places. Sure, too. like sure, sure. Said because earlier, yeah, because in the movies them. we've seen them only portrayed in one way, exactly. and it's interesting that. You know, it's almost certain that this is all going to come back around during the span of these episodes of Book of Boba Fett. Mm-hmm. That the Tuscans are going to come back in and play some sort of role in the uh, the city life, the yeah. the crime lord life of Boba Fett. Oh yeah, most definitely. And um, as been said in other places, another thing we probably said earlier, like said, the the dream sequence, the, the the past sequence, and the present day sequence are kind of mirrors of each other, not you know, kind of parallel to each other because like said, he's trying to get his respect from the uh, from the hut, and but we see him in the past getting you know getting uh, respect from you know get from the Tuscans. So, and I'm pretty sure this is probably going to be a, a thing going going forward in this series. So probably more flashbacks because I feel like this is the kind of the thing they're, they're, they're going to, I know we kind of said last week was like, yeah, hopefully they don't really do too many of those, but it sounds like this is, there's probably going to be more than that. Uh, kind of getting us up to speed. So, but it was a good set flow. I, I feel like I want to um, mirror uh, Dan Slott when he said like, this was a Star Wars ass Star Wars, uh, Star Wars episode. What was that? I'm sorry. I said I kind of want to mirror what uh, Dan Slott said. He didn't. I'm paraphrasing, but he basically said like this was a Star Wars ass episode. Like this was a Star <laughs> Wars ass Star Wars episode, and I kind of kind of agree with that. Like you know, like st- st- people like to think that hey, Star Wars is just the movies and it's Luke and them and whatnot and what was like. There's a lot more going on in the world of Star Wars in the universe of Star Wars that you know outside of that. So right. Right. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, that's something that the people who only know the movies just aren't privy to. Right. You know, if they never stepped out and read any of the old extended universe stuff, Mm -hmm. then they, you know, they're just not familiar with that. And unfortunately, you know, if you're not, you know, if you weren't into or, or at least willing to step into the world of animation, then you really didn't see that much more of Star Wars until... Uh, Disney bought the license, bought the property. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're right. You're right. So, I, I love I love Star Wars. So, hey, I'm I'm glad to see it. There haven't been too much too much bad stuff. <laughs> so I'm not complaining. Uh, well, you point. know, let, let's let, let's not let's not uh, be hyperbolic about this because not, you know, there there was I'm, some I'm there was some kind of not great stuff uh, I mean, that we look, saw people, in the movie. Like, yeah, yeah, Solo wasn't great, great, and probably not necessary, but it was. I mean, but it still wasn't bad. Like, no, let's not talk about. I let the, I'm I'm not talking about Solo. I'm talking uh, about, you know, other stuff. Okay, the movies. Oh, you not just the last three. Yeah, I mean they were. Yeah. I, again, I still, I'm still like they weren't for us. They weren't. They were not made for. They, <laughs> they were weren't for us. for us. They were made for. They were made for newer folks. Um, uh, uh, so and and with that's the case, you know, I kind of let that be what it is. <laughs> 
So they weren't for us. All right, moving on. Yes, moving on, folks. We are going to go into the comic books of the week. And we said we're going to start off with, I hope I got the shot right. Yes, I did. Good, great. Uh, with right. Inferno number four. Four, four. All right, Inferno number four. As I scroll up to the credits I have jotted down, Inferno number four is written by Jonathan Hickman, the creator and architect of the uh, Hox Pox uh, storylines in uh, X Men, in the pages of the X Men corner of the Marvel Universe and all that have come thereafter. Art is in, in this issue is by Valerio Schiti and Stefano Caselli. Color is by David Curiel. And letters by VCs Joe Sabino. So the action picks up essentially where we left off at the end of Inferno issue number three. And this is a four-issue limited series. Am I, am I correct? This is the last one of four, yes. So we pick up right where we left off with Professor X and Magneto uh, landing in Terra Verde, chasing after uh, what was just a part of a Moira McTaggart and being confronted by Orcus as well as uh, Omega Sentinel and uh, the latest version of Nimrod. And ultimately they... Uh, you know, it all descends into a melee, but the uh, the Orcus troops <laughs> take the worst of it because the uh, the two Sentinels don't see them as being necessary. Uh, meanwhile, we get a bit of a confrontation. We get a confrontation between uh, Destiny, Mystique, and their prisoner Moira McTaggart, and they do something to her that is cleared up and explained via flashback and i'll let roddy cap pick it up from there so yeah <laughs> um right do you see how i set that up i see how you set that up yes 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 um so i don't want to go too far into this but basically um there was there has been past history between uh, Myra McTaggart and Mystique and Destiny for reasons which led to this. Um, uh, Myra, we found Myra, we found out was a mutant. Her mutant power was uh, being able to live, um, basically live, relive her lives over again, almost Groundhog Day, but being able to change to affect change because she has all her memories. Uh, well, that gets stopped uh, in this particular. <laughs> that gets stopped here and now. And as foretold, mind you, from the beginning of Hot Spots, because they did say they were gonna, um, there was, there was, um, you know, uh, that they kind of had something going on to to stop it. So uh, while they have the Mario pr pr prisoner, they talk and they use this uh, weapon that we thought was gone uh, that we had not seen in many, many moons. Indeed, yeah, we have not seen this thing, and it was a, a, a weapon of and still is of some controversy because it is a weapon made by forge one two uh was made to take away mutant powers so uh that being said this gets used myra's powers gets taken away and now she's human like she got like they're suggesting she wants to be which i think she did because she's basically going she says that she wants to cure mutants so right. it, that this whole thing with Myro has been weird, and I feel like we've, at some point we might have to go back and kind of chop this chop this down uh, a little bit more. But right now, right. So I understand what you know, and, and you know, we'll just pause going through the issue just at this point, real quick, and just discuss this point because I I I bumped on this as well mm -hmm. because it's. You can look at it as Moira saying that this is one way for them to win and not be uh, made extinct as the result of all of the features that she has already foreseen, has already lived through, that is. Right. All of the features that she's lived through and come back to try to change essentially end up in essentially a very binary uh, 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 result. The mutants always lose. Mm-hmm. The winner is alternates 
between the humans, the machines, or the humans and the machines, but the mutants always lose. Right. So ultimately, she's trying to find a winning scenario, and the one scenario that she's come up with is get rid of all the mutants. Right. So if they don't have their mutant powers, they won't have to. They won't have to worry about this power struggle. Which I'm sitting here like that's not true because one that doesn't make them who they are. I mean that doesn't. That they don't keep who they are, and two that pretty much makes them baseline humans, and therefore it's still a power struggle between these other two. The the well, I guess potentially it could be because they're suggesting that if the mutants were not in the way, then this this whole power struggle thing wouldn't be happening. Right, which doesn't, which I feel like, sure could be possible, but no. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. It's weird. You know, like I said, you know, we'll leave it at that because right. we'll leave it for everyone else to read this. Obviously, we yeah, spoiled yeah. just a bit of this. Yeah. Uh, we did not ring the spoiler bell, so we're, I'm going to ring it uh, belatedly. But uh, come on, folks, you know, if you haven't been up on Inferno, this has been, uh, you know, uh, that was a pretty big twist mm -hmm. that comes out of left field. And, 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 what, and, and what we're talking about here, the, the solution that Destiny and this is what we won't spoil, the, the solution that Destiny and uh, Mystique come up with is, again, out of left field. Right. And it pretty much, yeah, without actually saying what's going on with it, because they are met with some resistance, but through this resistance, uh, um, uh, the rest of the, what we're, what we're going to come, what we're coming into uh, going forward kind of comes into being. Uh, and I will say that there's some things that get let out. There's some, some folks that um, don't, don't make it through this, but they don't worry about them. Um, and like I said, some some things come to light, and I guess this is now a new paradigm shift for the top end of Krakoa and right going down, right? Because there's some right because there are some power, there there are some shifts in power based on knowledge going into the end of this book, which basically sets us up for the Destiny of X hmm. uh, phase of this era of the X Men. So, uh, you know, we actually have, believe it or not, um, Cypher make an appearance and make a play for power. And, and at the end, we have a resetting of the Quiet Council, or mm -hmm. at least a reconfiguration. And a full Quiet Council at that, because up until now, we have not had a full council of 12 seats. Right. Uh, but now we do. And where we go from here, we don't know yet because, you know, this, this just happened and this is going to start reverberating through the other X books, I'm sure. And whatever new books come um, that are coming up during this year, which we know are coming because we've talked. So, yeah, this was, uh, yeah, I'm curious to see where it goes from here um, based on everything that happened in this, in this book. Like it feels like like yeah, there are people who have lesser power than they did coming into this, and there are people who gained some of that said power, uh, including uh you know like even somebody said um, uh, one Doug Ramsey Sam too who arguably was the most powerless person on this well one of the most powerless people uh mutants on this planet. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see what, uh, what's, uh, what's going to happen to this going forward. Uh, that being said though, and, oh, and we, and, and just to finish up, oh, sure. uh, apparently, no, what, what, what we get at the end of this issue though, is that immortal X-Men, the new spin, the new title oh, is yeah. essentially coming, is, is essentially exploding out of the pages of this book. Right, and that's one of them. that's yeah right. That's the one I, I guess are directly coming out of this book because we know there are others that's coming off coming out, kind of as a result of this going on. Right, but it's just it's it's important to mention because that is the uh, that is the book that's teased at the end of the issue. True, very true. So, and like I said, in the past couple of weeks we've seen other books end, and we know some of them are restarting, and there are new books that are coming. Like I said, so yeah, this is just right. a, a long in the slate of that. 
uh, that being said, though, we can kind of move along because, like, this is this was a potential click of the week for me. I don't know about uh, uh, Agent Agent Seventy because of how I think so. It was it was definitely something that took me off guard. Right. It we definitely sure. took yeah, me yeah. off guard because I mean it was it was bound to be a candidate because it is the uh, final issue in this pretty important miniseries. Right. You know, in the you know coming at the state at the stage that it's coming in, in the uh, the the Hox Pox Hickman story. So um, ultimately, you know, we'll, we'll you know I hate to parrot the same line that Marvel does, but you know, wait and see. We'll see where it goes. We'll right. just keep reading. But it's interesting to see that um, the Moira story is playing out this way. Right. Um, I did not expect to see the Moira story play out this way. Yeah, yeah. Like her part of this was like, like that was kind of the thing in in this whole thing. Uh, and and to, for it to come out like this was like okay. So and I, I, clearly at some point somebody I guess is going to revisit revisit her mm -hmm. um, in this whole thing at some point because clearly they they're going to have to. Well, they don't have to. I take that back. But they're probably want to, going to want to, I guess. You know, just to not leave that out there as a thing. Um, and yeah, like I feel like I guess the only other thing I can say, say in passing is like, yeah, there was this whole thing, and even though it was named Inferno based off of the the nineties, what was the nineties event? Whatever, it has nothing to really to do that. Whichever we are early, early. No, yeah, early. I was about to say. I want to say Inferno was was it early 90s? late eighties, maybe early nineties at the at the latest. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but nevertheless, in regardless of it was in name and not in in um in plot, there was still a lot to go to kind of benefit the, the it being called this because of like yeah stuff definitely did blow up um <laughs> but not in the same way the original event did and I feel like now that I think about it, there's a little Game of Thrones going on here and like granted I'm not the well versed on Game of Thrones but I feel like some of this is kind of they, they kind of seed a little bit of that. In the end of a little this. bit, yeah. yeah, yeah. There's definitely some 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 political slash you know Game of Thrones style intrigue, and Inferno actually does date to uh, 1989. Okay, so yeah. Wow, hmm, weird. <laughs> yeah, October October 88 to August 89. Yeah, again, to two totally different tones here, uh, but there are some you know some things going on here. Anyway, let us move on to another book, I guess. Uh, wait, what did you read? I know you read. Yeah, we don't really have that much in talk. Let's do Shang Chi. Shang Chi. All right, Shang Chi number seven. Seven. I I typed it in wrong in mine. Yeah. Uh, number seven. It's written by Gene Wen Yang with art by DK Ruan, colors by Triona Farrell, and letters by VCs Travis Lanham. I'm gonna ring the spoiler bell here because. Uh, if you're not caught up on the MCU, there is a definite spoiler in this book. So here it is in three, two, one. So Roddy Cat and I joked about this. We did. <laughs> We've joked about this for a while. We mm -hmm. kind of anticipated this happening once we heard that Shang-Chi was receiving an ongoing series in the wake of having uh, seen a solo movie in the MCU. And lo and behold, I, even after we've seen uh, six issues worth of Shang-Chi try to rehabilitate the, uh, uh, the crime uh, uh, syndicate that his uh, 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 father in the that is kind of retcon father in the in the comic books was uh was ruling over and you know the the the, the five weapons society we have ultimately caught up with shang chi's mother and the original origin of his mother was vastly different from what it is in the movies yep and what we find in this case, is that there is a newly placed retcon of what Shang-Chi's mother, uh, uh, where Shang-Chi's mother is from, and what her origin is, and it is suspiciously familiar if you have watched the Shang-Chi movie. Yes. All the way down to the creatures and Talo. 
Which we, but we, to be fair, which we have seen in the pages of this Shang Chi volume. So we have seen a couple right. of them recently. So yeah, we. So that was the other reason why we kind of figured, yeah, they're definitely going to be bridging the two. And sure enough, they did. So just a, just just a little bit. Um, I think we've talked about this in previous episodes of uh, when we talked about Shang Shang Chi. Um, he found his mom again. She wasn't dead. She was in a negative zone. He went to go get her. Uh, she was pounding around with some psychic mantis insect things, not to be confused with that mantis that uh, you, you may know or love, hopefully not from the movies. I'm not, well, I mean, that's not fair. That, I, <laughs> they could have, they had so much promise of, for that character. But anyway, um, uh, and so now he's with her and we get the backstory into her and uh, uh, Shang-Chi's father's meeting. Which, as Agent Seventy says, said, um, "Yeah, there's some some MCU blending going on <laughs> in this particular thing, and that's pretty much the gist of it. With ex- of this issue, with the exception of what happens at the end, which is um, um, uh, some amassed enemies of uh, Shang Chi's uh, past dealings, and including some someone that is in his own house." Um, uh, start start an attack, but like I said, yeah, the, the the crux of this issue was this whole thing with mom, and I'm sitting here like, we knew this was coming. We just, as the seven said, we joked about it, and we we it finally dropped. <laughs> right. So I like I'm not sure. Well, I know how I feel about it because I even said it before the show. It's like you know we know in the past that they have blended, they have blended MCU stuff back into the comics into a uh in a way that i am not crazy about right um and in this one i'm not as as bad about it with it but it's still kind of irksome <laughs> the, the fact that they did it like like i said you could you could say this one because like i said you know shang chi's parentage well as far as her dad kind of needed to change so that was that was a whole another that was another thing the thing with the mom we didn't know we i don't think we ever really knew that much about uh, even in the past we knew just she wasn't there she was gone she was potentially dead um but so it's not as bad as some of the other stuff we've seen but it's still like really they're just gonna keep um so everything in mcu pretty much is now being the basis of comic stories now or at least being blended into comic stories now as opposed to the whole history of you know the comics before that was already could have been used and already there kind of irksome so I don't know if you've got anything else you want to say about it but no I mean at the end of the day you know we <laughs> the comics and the movies are going to draw from each other now. We've joked about that. Mm-hmm. So, uh, it's it, it it was an inevitability. You know, we've seen it uh, in other places, and it's just, you know, this is more fertile ground because, uh, you know, we've only had that one main uh, master of kung fu run, and not as much of um, Shang Chi's story has been uh explored especially the stuff that they want to keep right you know there's stuff that they're more than willing to jettison as roddy cat mentioned so the the stuff that they're willing to keep leaves a lot of space for new stories and new concepts that more than likely are going to be introduced in the mcu side so you know at the end of the day what 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 roddy cat said is you know whether or not we like it it's just sort of a fact now so mm-hmm. we're just gonna have to cope and deal yeah 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 that's that's pretty much it yep yep all right president bartlett what's next um i guess we'll, we'll do amazing and then do uh wrap it sounds good to me all right amazing Spider-Man all right 84 yes amazing spider-man number 84 is written by cody ziggler with art by Paco Medina, colors by Espen Grundetjern, and letters by our favorite Paisan, VC's Joe Caramagna. Take it away, Roddy Cat. No, I'm I'm gonna have to uh, concede. Oh, to you're you. gonna defer? Yeah, because I skimmed this enough to where 
like I know what happened in the beginning, but I, you know more about what happened in this book than kind of not a problem. So essentially, what we have here is a is a follow up on one of the Beyonce issues where uh, <laughs> that is the dot bay issue, the B E Y issues, and what we have is uh, Doctor Octopus Otto Octavius delving deeper into beyond the beyond corporation and he literally has made his way to one of their data centers in new york city <laughs> looking to get more information on beyond meanwhile we catch up with uh ben riley uh undergoing some therapy and then uh trying to go out on a date night and he's interrupted because he's called into action by beyond because of the actions of one Otto Octavius. Right. The two do, in fact, tussle, and Otto, for a little while, gets the upper hand, but because of some of the technology that Beyond has been able to develop to counteract some of um, the Spidey villains that, um, that Ben Riley is uh, sure to encounter, uh, Ben Riley does... Uh, uh, gain some upper hand, but ultimately, Ock proves to be the smarter of the two, and that's you know that's that's not even a joke, because uh, that's just the fact of the matter. And would you, ultimately, would you, say, would you say that he's the superior? Ah, it does come up during this battle. It mm. does come up during this exchange, <laughs> and Ock does turn out to be the smarter of the two. And turns the tables yet again on Ben Riley and leaves him unconscious on the floor. And and Ock uh, gets away with uh, a hard drive, you know. And what's funny is that um, Ock makes a joke about how this uh, hard drive is air gapped, you know, keeping it off any, uh, uh, keeping making it unable to be accessed by any of the networks. Right. And. Uh, he's like, well, this is a primitive way of keeping uh, of making this secure, but it's you know, <laughs> it's it, you know, he's just kind of poking fun at the whole thing, right. and ultimately, uh, well, especially for we, a company such as Beyond, exactly, right, right, and ultimately, at the end of the issue, we have uh, Ock making uh, uh, making an arrangement to see uh, good old Maxine Danger. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so the, the only thing I could I could add, add to this is like one, how in the hell do you not know who Doctor Octopus is? You because in the beginning where it was like I don't know he they, one of the uh, guys that the uh, that that brought him in, well the guy that brought him in was like I don't know I just thought it was an old uh, an old granddad looking for his uh, grandkid or something. I'm like, how do you not know what Doc Ock looks like? Well, but you, you know, know there's young, you know, the you know the dude is young. Yeah, maybe he's just sheltered. Yeah. Uh, it's not like he's walking around at that point with the arms, ex the extra arms exposed. So, True. but I mean, but at the same time, well, one, he doesn't look that much different than he ever actually has at this point. And I mean, yes, I know it can't happen, but like you said, you hit the the first thing you said, hit the nail on like he's young, <laughs> and that's why I even said to my nose, so like, yeah, damn, millennials don't know anything, don't pay attention to stuff. <laughs> so it's like right. okay, and then and then Ox is kind of coming in, wrecking shop, and and doing what he, you know, what he ultimately right. did. And it's not like this is the uh, the the Spider Man branch of the operation. Yeah. Well, yeah, I guess that's that is also true. But I feel like you know, Doc Ox probably been, is known enough to where at least there there should be some semblance, or at the very least, their security would have been like, or they would have had some security of. That we're like, hey, this is Doc Ock. We can't, <laughs> we can't let him in here. You know, again, no, they have, no, they no. have stuff I mean, to fight. They, Beyond has stuff to fight him. You mean to tell me they can't? They're not thinking. It's like, well, maybe they might want to. You know, they might come around. <laughs> so that was the thing. It, 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 it was just something that I thought funny. What, I'm not taking it that like that seriously, but it was like it was just kind of funny to me that that part. I got you. I get it. I get it. All right. So yeah, so that but that was that. I was like, I'm gonna have to read this over uh, over again because like I kind of kind of glanced through it and the whole therapy thing. I suppose it, supposedly it's gonna mean something going forward, um, and whatever Ox is going to do when he meets Maxine Danger, we'll see. That being said, we can go on to um, rapid fire. I will spin it up. I ain't got time to move.
Yeah. You want me to lead off? Go for it. All righty. First up for me is Batman number 119. It's written by Joshua Williamson with art by Jorge Molina, Adriano Di Benedetto, and uh, Mikel Janin. Um, there is, in fact, a backup story in this issue involving um, Maps Miguchi from uh, Gotham Academy. It's uh, written and drawn by Carl Kershaw. Uh, colors on the main story by uh, Tomo Mori and letters by Clayton Cowell. So when we last saw the now international traveler Batman, we found him in Southeast Asia in a not, you know, uh, uh, you know, DC has a terrible habit of uh, creating places that have terrible names. Kandak. This one is Badanesia. I'm like, really? Yeah. So uh, what we found at the end of the previous issue is that Batman Incorporated is under the suspicion of uh, murdering uh, a villain. And it's also revealed that uh, Lex Luthor dun, 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 is the new uh, backer of Batman Incorporated. And um, it is apparently no big secret between uh lex and uh batman that lex knows uh batman's um secret identity and ultimately what we get is a bit of a, a tete a tete between lex and uh bruce wayne during this issue but at the end of the issue uh, Batman goes into detective mode and finds out that not all is as it seems with regards to the murder that he has come to investigate uh, in order to try to clear the members of Batman Incorporated. Next up is Black Widow number 13. I think Bl uh, Roddy Cat read this. I did, yes. It's written by Kelly Thompson with art by Raphael Pimentel, colors by Jordi Belair, and letters by VCs Corey Pettit. So this issue is told entirely in flashback. And the flashback is part of the... Um, well, we've gotten introduced to this character called uh, the Living Blade. Yes. Not exactly the best name, <laughs> but... Uh, you know, it's an interesting premise in that uh, we all know that uh, Natasha Romanoff is one of the most highly skilled fighters in the Marvel Universe and um, or at least human level, you know, fighters in the, in the Marvel Universe. And it's always interesting to see her come up against a character that she uh, finds herself uh more than evenly matched by and this is a flashback to one of these characters that has been retconned i don't think this is an old character no i, I think, think this is a, is a new character. character yeah and so it's a retcon back to a time when natasha is wearing the gray suit you know in our time think late 80s early 90s mm -hmm. and ultimately what we have is like i said a flashback uh, issue which has uh, which basically describes their big first encounter where uh, Natasha is essentially running for her life and the living blade is basically uh, on her heels but when they get to a particular point the living blade backs off and we're left to try to figure out what causes him to back off and no, it's we, pretty. It's pretty clear. Not necessarily. Yeah. We find out. No, we know why, but right. we don't know why he stops there. Oh, I got you. That's what you're saying. Got you. See what I mean? I got you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. We know he stops there for you know. We know why he stops there, but right. we don't know why he he actually stops there. Sure. Like what was, you know, what? Why did he find himself at that point? Like, oh, you know what? I'm gonna choose now. I to say a, until next time. I have a theory on that, and I feel like it, it plays into what you, you what you were pre, pretty much thinking, given what was going on in that scene, right? But yeah, we don't we don't necessarily know, but I feel like yeah, that's pretty. I feel like it's clear enough, but yeah, we'll find out anyway. Continue. Right, exactly. There's more to it. Yeah. So you know, and 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 ultimately, this is a flashback that's going to inform what happens or their interactions that Natasha has with the Living Blade in the present. Right. Uh, anything else to add? 
No, nah, it's pretty much like like you said. It's, it's gearing up for a rematch uh, in the present day, and we'll see how that how that. Um, I feel like they're they're probably gonna draw it out because they don't w- wouldn't want to do like here's a back to back fight. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. the thing, and then we'll start over, start this over again. But it, but the at the end of the thing, it did say rematch, so we don't we, we'll see. And that's pretty much that. All righty. Next up is Thor number twenty. It's written by Donny Cades with art by Nick Klein, colors by Matt Wilson, and letters by VCs Joe Sabino. So um, there is an unfortunate passing that is portrayed. Uh, I think it was portrayed at the end of last issue, in the beginning of this issue, and um, it's a it's a longstanding Thor side character. That we've seen, uh, you know, here and there uh, over the course of the many years that Thor has been published by Marvel. If you're not familiar with the story as it's uh, as um, as it's developed recently in the pages of Kate's Thor, Mjolnir has started to uh, misbehave, and uh, some of the enchantments that. Uh, Odin put on Mjolnir have not been working, especially the worthiness requirement of lifting Mjolnir. And what's been happening is that Mjolnir has been running amok and basically is wreaking havoc throughout the Ten Realms. And there is a reveal uh, at the end of the issue that harkens back to a line that Anthony Hopkins gives in Thor Ragnarok, which is an element of the MCU that is now being woven into at least a story idea, not necessarily an element of the movie and of the characterization of Thor in the movie, but just a line. It's a line that's it's not a throwaway, but it's definitely something that sticks out. And when you realize that Kate took that particular line and created something out of it, it's kind of cool. But at the same time, when I was reading this, I was kind of like, oh, okay, I get it. All right, and that is that for Thor number 20. Last but not least is X-Men number six. It's written by Jerry Duggan with art by Pepe Larraz, uh, colors by Marte Gracia, and letters by VC's Clayton Cowell. So I know that Roddy Cat intends to read this, so I am not going to spoil this. But let me tell you that we are introduced to a new character. It's not a big it's it's not a spoiler in the sense that the character is on the cover, and the co- and the and the character is called Captain Krakoa. Uh, but what is disconcerting to myself as a as a regular X Men reader is that I was reading this thinking, what on earth is going on? What did I miss? And I actually went back to X Men number five, and I realized I didn't miss anything. It's just that this issue uh, basically moves a lot of the subplots that we've been following forward, and is going to uh, force us all to read the next issue to see what we missed. It's not, it's definitely not told in a strict chronological sense. So we're definitely going to see flashbacks that help us fill in some of what we seem to have missed over the last, you know, you know, whatever time has passed in between issues five and six. Gotcha. Do we get at the very least a hint of who this person is? I said I, I figured it's probably like somebody we don't know. I'm assuming. No, not yet. Okay, so they just kind of okay. Yeah, just, they're doing one of those things. Gotcha. Yeah, I'm no. I'm I'm curious to read this. I'm I'm definitely gonna check this out when I when I get a chance. Uh, probably after the show. Right. And what's funny is that when you when you read it, you'll realize what I mean. Right. That not exactly sure you know as a reader we're not exactly sure how we got to this point and there are some subplots that have been running through the pages of x-men that kind of get turned on their head and you're left figure trying to figure out what just happened Mm -hmm. so we'll find out more than likely we'll find out uh in flashback over the next issue or two cool well if that is it yep that's it for me all right, then I'll just hit my two books real quick. And we start off with 
Uh, where are you? Oh, I wish I had read that. Uh, Magic, number 10. Uh, written by uh, one of our faves, Jed McKay. Uh, illustrated by Ed Guara. Colors by Ariana Consoni. And letters by Ed Dukeshire. So, the, the rough uh, cut of this is that this, uh, the last few issues have been building up to this big battle um, with uh, this entity that is coming to uh, well, it was going to Ravnica, but it's pretty much going to coming into the universe uh, trying to find followers and gain more power and uh, basically take over. Um, our three main planeswalkers kind of has this plan with a whole bunch of other planeswalkers and if you, if you don't know anything about magic the gathering um the world is is, is a fantasy land and they're made up of different places and different planeswalkers of different uh, um who mastered any uh different uh elements uh and disciplines uh so you you know you have the the, the fire person you have the water person you the, and the water person's mind person and you know you got necromancers and you got um you know uh et cetera et cetera et cetera so uh you get of course you know um you know people who can heal and all that kind of good mess but regardless um there's this whole they, they set up this whole big plan to uh to um basically not put the world in in harm's way and they go to this one dead world so so they could lure this into the inn so they could uh kind of trap them there the plan kind of goes relatively without a hitch but uh but part of the plan was that um um but part of the plan uh involved someone making a sacrifice and uh that kind of goes a way a different way but uh, in the end, the plan kind of works, sort of, but at the end of it, kind of, maybe doesn't? We don't know, because at the end, we kind of see uh, a scene in, in a place that um, that may, uh, may confer that while the plan kind of initially worked, it, it didn't quite work 100% the way they thought it would. Uh, I was thinking that this was probably going to be the end of this book uh, for some strange reason, and I don't know why. I know that this is definitely an ongoing, so this is not a limited series, but, you know, I, I, it seemed, it, it weirdly felt like they were kind of just wrapping it up uh, all in total, but it's not. So thankfully, because, you know, it's been kind of a fun book. Um, and like I said, after that whole battle thing, and, and uh, we, we kind of get back into the world, we see like this, that there's something a little, a little different, a little off here. So to, that we'll find out more about the, in the next issue. And my last book is uh, Star Trek. Dun, 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 dun. Star Trek, The Mirror War number three. Um, written by Scott and David Tipton. Art by Gavin Smith. Colors by Charlie Kirchhoff. Kirchhoff and letters by Neil Yurtake. So as I say in my notes, after some overzealous negotiations with uh, Mirror Universe Riker and LaForge that ends up blowing up a solar system, um, the the Enterprise kind of has to lay low and um, dodge their enemies because they're trying to set off this one big plan, but they needed to go and get some supplies to do so, and that didn't work out that well. Uh, so now it kind of puts them on the radars of their enemies a little bit more. So LaForge and, and crew kind of hatched this plan to um, to kind of get circumvent some stuff. Uh, and during the course of this plan and acting, we see some uh, beef come up between uh, Mirror Data and Barkley based on some past stuff. But we also get a little bit of skullduggery from a person we, you know, if you've seen uh, them in the timeline well we only seen him like once in the uh star trek timeline or at least once twice in the time uh, the star trek timeline you would think that this person wasn't capable of doing what they did but this is the mirror universe and everybody's out for themselves as this, as this book so plainly says and um uh let's just say that uh, chief o'brien gets to go uh to a very familiar spot but not in a way that he would choose to <laughs> at the end of this book um 
in its mirror form at, at that point. So, yeah. This is, I don't know how many more episodes, uh, I guess, it's, I don't know what this is, it says, but I know this is an event. Uh, uh, I'm not sure how many issues are left in this thing, but it's continued to truck along, and they have had to done the thing where it's like, there's a one shot for this and that and the other, but, and some other stuff. But, um, yeah, it's continued to still be all right. Um, and that is it for me. We can go on to clicks of the week. Week, week. You ready? Oh, you're muted. Sorry about that. I didn't realize I had done that just to uh, j just so I could uh, make noise on my side. <laughs> All right, I was actually looking. I was re look. I was rereading parts of X Men number six, okay. and I just wanted to amend something that I had said. It does seem like we find out who Captain Krakoa is. Okay. Is this a known person or not? Just uh, know. yeah. Okay. Part of it kind of felt but, like, it, but I'm not sure. What I wasn't sure if that was the case or not. Right, and ultimately we you know we're we're left trying to figure out how all this stuff is going to play together. Right. But anyway, all right. Uh, Clicks of the week. We have. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Hit the, hit the thing. We have. Uh, oh, you that? already did. You already did. Never mind. I did. I hit it. Yeah, so yeah. we actually have, uh, as Roddy Cat was about to say, we actually have clicks from uh, both of our absent co-hosts. So as he goes through those two, I am going to deliberate on my own. And the first one we have is from Dirt, which is, I, uh, well, no, his wasn't the first, but no one, I was going to do it anyway. Um, his is Arkham City, The Order of the World, number four. He says he finally got caught up with the series, and it's much better than expected. Uh, it plays out more like a classic vertical title from the early days of the line. Uh, the art is really unique, too. Uh, he's looking forward to seeing where it goes. And uh, for Tim... Um, actually, for Tim, uh, it is Inferno number four, and we've already talked about that. And yeah, I can understand why that was a <laughs> why yeah, that was yeah, fun. yeah. I think I'm gonna second that. Okay, I think I'm gonna second Inferno number four for a click of the week for me. Yeah, like I'm sitting here, like I, I, it, it is definitely a book that's making you. It's kind of get, getting you geared up to seeing what's gonna what's coming ahead for certain um and actually i think i said before the show like this is this is probably the strongest book of the week so i'm actually thinking well you know what hmm hmm i did like magic 10 uh a good bit um But, uh, yeah, you know what? I'm going with uh, Inferno number four also. All righty. Because, yeah, that, there's there's a there's a lot to unpack there, even this, this, <laughs> despite that it feel like it did it, it a lot of unpacking itself. But there's there's some things to come that we don't know what's going to happen with. And I'm looking forward to seeing that. Yeah, that's going to be it'll be something to it'll be something to digest. Yeah. When when the, the fallout from the events of this Inferno series come, you know, come down in the next uh, wave of X books. Mm -hmm. All right. With that, we can go on to uh, the news section. But first, an ad read. Our first ad read is for Funko Fun at First Sight. Your home for exclusive collectibles such as their world-famous pop vinyl bobbleheads, apparel including t-shirts, hats, and socks, and brand merchandise such as custom DIY pop figures. And now the listeners of the Comic Book Chronicles can enjoy 10% off your entire purchase when shopping at Funko. To place your first order with 10% off and to help keep our show free for you, go to our network website at cspn.us. That's cspn.us. Then click on the Keep Our Podcast Free link at the top of the page. From there, scroll down to the Funko link and place your order. When you get to the checkout, put in the offer code SHOP10, that's S-H-O-P-10, for your 10% off discount. Funko through CSPN.US. Do it today. 
And now we get into the news. And we start off with uh, the cinematic news like we do every week as I try to mess with some shots here. Um, first off, uh, Spider-Man No Way Home's amazing co-stars nearly had a much different introduction. So this is a kind of spoiler for me because I still haven't seen Spider-Man No Way Home. Oh! But, but I, with all the rumors swirling around these particular people, you know, it was it was inevitable, I guess. I knew there was something I forgot to ask Roddy Cap before we started the show. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so I'm not going to go too far into this, but if you have seen um, Spider-Man No Way Home, you know there are some people that show up uh, that was probably a surprise to you when you did see it. I feel like it's less of a surprise to me based on what they were set, setting up, but at the same time, yeah, it would have been nice not to be spoiled, but it's kind of the nature of the beast when you're one getting the news and two, you know, uh, not being not <laughs> going to the theater like you probably should have, or not actually. No, I'm not even regretting not going to the theater because hey, because we got too much going on. Right, because yeah, I was about to say, you know, Omarion's going to put an icebox where your heart used to be. Right. So, and I'm not that crazy. Um. So therefore, hey, it is what it is on that one. But like I said, this was this particular spoilers for these particular characters. You know, it's been hinted at, and it's and it's not like there wasn't uh, enough to support, you know, those being the case. Um, so not surprised, but yeah, but basically these characters could have been introduced in a different way uh, than what they probably did when they get to the movies. Move right along. <laughs> All right. So next up, uh, in in a in a different twist, we find out that Jessica Henwick, who played Colleen Wing in uh the awful iron fist and a little less awful defenders um turned down the role of sha ling in the shang chi movies because she was actually hoping for colleen wing to return in the mcu at some point so you know while there is some hope that this will happen um you know, I, I'm actually impressed that uh, Jessica Henwick, you know, felt that strongly about her portrayal of Colleen Wing that she wanted to keep hope alive mm -hmm. to have that character return in the MCU. I love that, though. And just like, you know what? And she was realistically, let's face it, she was the best thing about Iron Fist. So, <laughs> um, absolutely right. So let's let us be clear here. I I am I was so glad to see this article. And granted, this was a couple of weeks old, but still, I wanted to bring it up, you know, because um, because I, I think I probably forgot to put it in the lineup. But regardless, like this was cool to see. Like she 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 believes in the character. And she believes they're gonna do it, and we do have evidence to see that it could be more potential uh, for it to happen now, thanks to Hawkeye, and probably thanks to Spidey. But and, you know, uh, but potential is still there. So we'll see if the, if Marvel gets off their ass. <laughs> but next up, um, which by the way, um, I'm going to take this time to ask, and I think I, um, Agent Seventy is going to because there's something I need to put in the. Um, I think I forgot to put in the clickbait section. There is that Slugfest um, um, docu series that the Russo brothers produced. Uh, that is out on the Roku channel. I th and it will should be a um a link in the clickbait section for that. If you have not seen it, you should. Uh, if you are interested in in that, it's is it's a it's pretty interesting stuff. Uh, it's well done. I watched it. It, yeah. it goes quickly because it's only uh you know it, it's in a bunch of seven minute clips. So right, yeah. It's like none of them are last no longer than ten minutes because apparently, as we found out or forgot that they, it was made for Quibi, which is supposed to be bite sized anyway. But yeah, it's some good stuff, some good stories in there. The, the one section with uh, Louise Simonson was pretty good. <laughs> uh, but you know, good stuff. And the reason why I mentioned that after that is because there are some folks in there. It's pretty star studded. I say for that. Not, but not. Well, Jessica Hendrick was. Hendrick, wait, I don't think she was in it. But regardless, some other no, people. Simone, Simone Missick was in it. Yeah, uh, Chris uh, Bitter was in it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh -huh. Yes. Um. Uh, Deborah Wall, Vincent D'Onofrio. You know, uh, mm. Clark Gregg. Oh, you know, like a bunch of stuff. But uh, Lou Ferrigno was in it. There's, there's kind of a drunk history style thing kind of going on with that. Uh, without the drunkenness. 
Uh, right. But uh, it's some, it was some cool stuff, and I right I some some it. some historical reenactments. Yes. You yes. know, like we had, I think Brandon Routh was playing Joe Simon. Yep. So it was it was interesting. There's some actors that you will recognize. Yeah, like pretty much most of the people that that show up there, like yeah, they would be in some related material to this, and it makes sense. Right, and it's narrated by Kevin Smith. There you go. So. So it all comes around. So yeah, check that out. And like I said, it'll be in the uh, clickbait section. But moving right along, um, Guardians of the Galaxy. Well, James Gunn confirms that there are Marvel characters. Wait, I'm sorry. This is you. No, it's not. No, I did this. I'm sorry. This was supposed. <laughs> this was supposed to be you. There's a reason for this. Um, James Gunn confirms that Marvel characters can't legally uh, appear. One of those characters is. Rom Space Knight. I know. I saw this tweet. I retweeted <laughs> it. It was awful. Yeah. And as folks may or may not know, uh, Agent 70 is a big Rom Space Knight uh, fan. So I know, if, yeah, even if you hadn't seen it and you had seen it just now, you, it was kind of hurt by this. But yeah, as Agent 70 said, there was a tweet that uh, James Gunn had put out that confirmed at least uh, two characters that he wanted to put in but could not. Rom Space Knight was one of them. And because because uh, Marvel doesn't have the rights to him um, anymore, that would be uh, Hasbro slash um, actually that's Hasbro. Yeah, it's straight uh, up Hasbro because it's yeah. uh, because it's a it's a toy property. Right. 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 So Marvel used it as part of a licensed, uh, you know, as part of a license from I think it was Galoob, and Galoob uh, uh, became property of Hasbro eventually. So all that IP belongs to Hasbro. Mm -hmm. And um, what was the other one? Was it Bug? Wait, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, I think it was Bug. Okay. Because because Micronauts is also also ended up being a Hasbro right prop. That's correct. Yeah. So say one thing about and, and if you're a certain vintage, you know both of those because you may or may not have read Round Space Knight and or Micronauts. <laughs> or maybe have had the toys. But again, certain vintage because those are like early eighties toys. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so yeah uh you know it's just a shame about rom because you know rom played such a big role in the marvel universe for a while that you know as and and and, and uh especially for creators of james gunn's generation you know that's probably just a touch older than us mm -hmm. you know that uh you know that it's uh you know uh, that it's a shame that because of the license issues that it, it can't, you know, that the character can't be put into the MCU. Yeah, and maybe that could change at some point, just like with uh, other characters that were. You mean when Disney it. buys Hasbro? <laughs> yeah, most assuredly. <laughs> so, at this point, anyway. that is probably most assuredly. But moving right, right. along, though. All right, next up, so um, Yelena's Hawkeye gear. So this is a spoiler for uh, the Hawkeye television show on Disney+. Plus. Uh, Yelena's gear includes a hidden Black Widow Easter egg accessory. So the Hawkeye costume designer, Michael Crow, offered some insight into the choice of, quote, flair that Yelena wears on her striking coat in episode five, Ronan. During an interview with Insider, uh, Crow said it was another carryover from her costume from the end of Black Widow that she had lots of enamel pins. He explained there's a direct and obvious link to the film in the form of a spider pin. There's also a pin that even more that's even more personal to Yelena herself, a finger gun. So I think this is the coat that uh, she's wearing. It, no, wait, this is the coat that she's wearing when she says... Hi. Right when she's in, um, when she's in and eating macaroni department. and cheese. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, and you, if you're watching the video version of the um podcast, you can see uh a, the image of uh said coat. And well, with, and with her in it, and yeah, you can kind of make out a couple of them, like the finger guns one and the the glass. You can kind of make out one. The spider one's kind of hard to make out. Regardless, it's all there. So, didn't pick out that. There it is now. Next up, um, Spider-Man spinoff Morbius' seventh delay sends New Mutants trending for some reason. So I saw this on, on Twitter. I was like, why in the world is New Mutants trending? Come to find out it's because the fact that Morbius got delayed again. And I guess they likened it to the, the numerous amounts of times that the New Mutants movie got, um, got delayed 
so and it looks like let me see the film is yeah and that's exactly what the case is and I don't know when let's see does it say here when Morbius is coming I let's see da, da, da. no don't know uh, oh wait uh, you know what don't know don't care because it, it just uh, the thing talks more about um. Yeah, it talks more about New Mutants than 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 Morbius, which I'm fine with. And I still haven't seen New Mutants, by the way. Oh wait, it says April first, twenty twenty two, for Morbius. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I was about to say, I, I I was gonna say like end of March or April. Yeah. So, so don't care. Um, <laughs> and I still need to see New Mutants. But well, you know what the rumor is, right? What's that? Oh, the about the. Um, them kind of right, the, yeah, exactly. The rumor is that they're doing reshoots to try to fit in some of the things that have been popping off as a result of Spider Man No Way Home, right? Right, and I guess the end of Venom, or the end uh, of right. Venom, yeah, 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 right, 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 right. Mm-hmm. Move right along. Uh, next up, uh, Peacemaker series creator James Gunn revealed how many episodes of the show there will be. Replying to a question on Twitter, Gunn delighted fans by confirming every episode of the show will feature an extra scene after the credits. Oh, no, he actually says that um, he says that they're going to all include post credit scenes. Right. Whether worth anything or not, this is me editorializing. Who knows? But it's Peacemaker. You know, it's one of those kind of quirky characters that Gunn is going to have fun with. And, uh, you know, does it really matter to to anyone who who who's kind of a a comic book fan? Not really. Did you really care about Peacemaker before this? No. Nope. You're right. You're right. Uh, but yeah. Moving you know, well, I mean, if it turns out to be funny, it turns out to be funny. But I don't. I'm not counting on it to be earth shattering or ground shaking or, no. or, or 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 anything like that. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You are absolutely right. Move right along, though. I neglect. I almost did not put this in here, but uh, for reasons you'll understand uh, shortly. Zack Snyder fans demand Justice League's deleted Green Lantern scene. So yeah, th- those stupid ass Zack Snyder fans are at it again. Well, actually, I think they've been doing this because I feel like this is not the first time that this has come up. But regardless, um, fans are wanting that the the Green Lantern scene from from Zack Snyder's uh, Justice League be put back into the movie. Uh, it was tr- I think there was a petition there. It was trending on Twitter for some stupid re- for reason, um, and people are stupid. Let's move along. <laughs> Next up, uh, update. The CW CEO confirmed Warner Media and Viacom CBS's plan to sell uh, the CW network in a company memo obtained by The Hollywood Reporter. The original version of the story uh, basically was that uh, Warner Media and Viacom CBS were said to be. In... <laughs> Excuse me, I didn't hit the mute button. Were said to be in discussions with multiple potential buyers to sell the CW with station owning giant next star media group said to be the front runner. I guess we're not talking about Royco shout out to anyone who watches succession. Huh? Yeah. So I am kind of curious as to what this is going to uh, mean going forward. Now I'm also kind of wondering, not I'm thinking about it because we, they've how long they've been planning to do this because we know some shows have ended. Right. Uh, and the Arrowverse specifically. Um, and, you know, I think the only one, and there was like supposedly a rumor of Arrow coming back. I don't know if that one was actually true, but um, I'm fairly certain that one probably was not true, but, you know. Uh, but some things here and there, we don't know. Uh, so I guess we'll we'll keep tabs on this to see what happens and how it is going to affect any Arrowverse shows going forward. Uh, next up, though, Invisible, blah, 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 blah. Invisible Star Stephen Yuen uh, re- reveals surprising update on season two. And that update is they haven't even started working on it yet. Whoops. Yeah. So it says here, uh, they haven't started. I know we're starting at some point. Uh, he said uh, he talked to Robert Kirkman here and there. He's super excited about the. This is Stephen Yuen talking. 
Um, he thinks stupid uh, season two is going to be even better than season one, which was actually pretty good, um, which he has no doubt about. Um, and I guess he went on to note how surprised he was about the response to the first season saying, did not expect this level of response. Uh, I'm assuming most of it was positive because for most of the part I've seen <laughs> most positive stuff about that show. So, so that's curious that they have not started even at this point. Cause that, that was like a good almost year or two good. Like how I many time is what it is at this point. But you know, that was a while ago when that first season came out. Mm -hmm. so the fact that they didn't start on working on it knowing that season two was uh was coming or after they the, the, was official that season two was coming and still haven't started by now it's kind of curious so well maybe we'll find out what happened maybe we won't move right along uh interesting did you put the story in after we talked about it which the the one this one right here mm -hmm. uh no that was before Oh, no kidding. Well, what's funny about this is that this isn't really cinematic news. This is more comic book news. Yeah. Because it's a manga. Yeah, and, and uh, that has happened where, you know, I, I put it in the wrong place because of <laughs> not fully reading it through. So. Do you want me to talk about it now? Sure, or do just... it. Yeah, yeah, just go ahead and do it. All right. So uh, for anyone that is a fan of the My Hero Academia uh, anime and the manga, actually, I literally, literally just um, read the entirety of the My Hero Academia manga over the last week or so. So this is good. And... This is not a spoiler for you then. <laughs> What's that? I said, so that's good. So this is not a spoiler for you then. Oh, this is definitely not a spoiler. So apparently, uh, well, not apparently, definitely, the, the My Hero Academia manga is quickly coming to its final battle between Izuku Midoriya and the young heroes of Class 1A versus All for One Shigaraki and the League of Villains. However, even as the latest chapter of My Hero Academia's manga outright dictates that there's nothing left but the final all-out war between heroes and villains. It also slips in the explosive tease that there is yet a secondary battle that could, as all the might puts it, decide it all. So what is this battle that's being dangled in front of our eyes? Is it one we saw coming all along or a new twist? My Hero Academia has for us. I can tell you that uh, I, as a superhero fan, uh, definitely recommend my hero academia as a gateway uh anime for superhero fans because a lot of it will feel very familiar um horikoshi the mangaka who created this uh uh manga is heavily influenced and is a big fan of marvel and the mcu movies so uh you will definitely f see that influence in a lot of the characters and a lot of the way the characters interact on in the stories. So, um, and there's definitely an X-Men feel because it is, you know, following students at a school. So there's all sorts of different ways that you can see the strong influence of American superhero comics in this uh, uh, manga and the anime. So the... Um, the uh, the anime may not be much longer because uh, the anime actually goes pretty far into the manga has actually made its way pretty far into the manga at this point. Mm -hmm. And again, basically, and being that this is the last few chapters of this, if I'm not mistaken, and they can actually they don't have to basically do that much more fillers because this is it's already out there and they can just adapt it um, properly. Um, so yeah, that's good. And, and yeah, it's not just and it's not just students with school because you know, students in the school with uh, but it's students with with powers that mm -hmm. for the most part, if I'm not mistaken, most of them, if not all of them, with the exception of probably Midori, uh, got theirs genetically, or right, right, yeah, right, so, right. Well, that's so, the I mean that's the the premise of the story is that eighty percent of the world has powers, right. So yeah, so like you said, it's definitely an X Men situation uh, in that respect. Definitely, definitely. So, uh, Roddy Cat, are you up on this anime, or you're just like part uh, way yes. through? So anime check. I have not watched this yet. Like the only the couple of um, the couple of um, episodes that I told you that I saw in the beginning. I was debating <laughs> after after what I told you earlier about um, what I have caught up on, which was Demon Slayer. For for those curiosity, uh, I have caught up on that. This is probably going to be either the next one I do or probably finish up Super. 
Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. And probably hit a short one like uh, Samurai Champloo, we kind of revisit that one. Um, because like, there's I, I got a bunch in the pocket, and like I said, I started on this one, but I never really go back to it. So at this point, I probably will start this up real, real soon. Right. This is like a medium, you know, and, and my idea of medium length is anything that's not One Piece or uh, Naruto is yeah. medium length. Right. You know, stuff that I'm more than willing to give uh, some time to because it's not that kind of time sink. So, um, oh, and, and, and as a quick notice for, for, for uh, people out there, especially at Boss Jones on, uh, on Twitter, actually, um, you'd have to look up uh, because I don't think uh, his, uh, his uh, Insta is up right now. I think uh, he's having some issues with it. So I think he's under I am Professor X E X. Huh. That's funny. Uh, he is the uh, the person who got me hooked into uh, Attack on Titan uh, before I went on my uh, my anime uh, deep dive uh, for the pandemic. So, uh, just as a reminder, Attack on Titan, the second part of the final season of the anime, is premiering this Sunday, yep. the ninth. Yep, yep, yep. So, fans of uh, AOT. Rejoice. I know I've seen some out there, including our own um, Agent 70. Right. And, uh, you know, especially if your uh, football team is not in any sort of position to do anything important for the playoffs <laughs> and you don't have any football to watch in the afternoon, you may want to tune in to Attack on Titan when it finally premieres around 3 o'clock Eastern time. Um uh, on Funimation, Crunchyroll, and Hulu. Hmm. Actually, that does remind me of a, a story, a Demon Slayer story I was going to tell you, but it's not not that 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 interesting. It was just something amusing. But I'll tell you later. Anyway, moving right along. All right. Um, I think this is you. No, I just did the My Hero. Oh, okay. Uh, AMC steps into anime industry by buying Sentai High Dive Streaming. Uh, and I've seen that high dive out, but I never did check it out. Anyway, um, AMC Networks is now getting in on the, the anime game, apparently. Uh, a new report has confirmed that the group has acquired Sentai and High Dive's uh, streaming service as a way to bring anime into its portfolio. Uh, quote unquote, with strong industry relationships and access to key content creators in Japan, Sentai distributes uh, and curates one of the animes, blah, 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 company line, blah, 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 shut up. Um, but yeah, the, the high dive app is in a couple of different places and some of the content that Sentai, Sentai deals with is on Crunchyroll, Hulu, and Amazon Prime. So yeah, it says here that Sentai will be bringing high dive to AMC Networks' array of streaming services. Uh, oh, I didn't know they own Shudder. Okay. Shudder is the hotter, horror, um, app. Let's see. AMC Plus, Sundance Now, and more. Uh, at this time, there's no word whether uh, any of Sentai's licenses will be aired on AMC Network's cable channels, but fans are hopeful. Uh, the company has some major licenses under its belt, include uh, including Made in Abyss, Food Wars, Clannade, No Game, No Life, k and more. And uh, anime fans will know at least two or probably four of the, or probably most of those, honestly. So, that's a thing. Cool. Next up. Oh no, we're tra we're transitioning, right? Oh yes, we are. Wait, all right, hold on for a second. Let me check. Oh yeah, I guess we are. Oh, you know what? Yeah, I was I about to say. I did have try another to reload. One. Well, so I did have another one because um, but it had nothing to do with comic books. It was basically um, our R.I.P. debater White, who d uh, passed away on um on December thirty first. Has nothing to do oh, with comic yes. books, but but still, you know, she was a natural treasure. So of course. Uh, of that course, was be, that was going to be the last one in the uh, in the cinematic news. Oh uh, my goodness! You know, rest in peace, Betty White. You know, I was uh, heartbroken, mm -hmm. and it's a crying, you know, and 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 it's tough because you know they were actually starting to publish things in advance of her hitting her 100th birthday, right? January. Right. Mm -hmm. She ended up passing away just about three weeks short, and it's a shame that she wasn't with us to celebrate her 100th birthday. Right, and but that but, she's not going to be with us to celebrate right. her one hundredth birthday. Right, I, I, as I said on on Twitter, I was like, you know what, she passed on December thirty first, so she could be reborn on the first. 
<laughs> that you know, you know the, the whole story of baby new year and the you know when you're back in less situation but you know hey time will tell if i'm right i mean she, i was about to say oh she could be my remember tiger tiger but i but much more happy um yeah right anyway we're going to transition over into the comic book news <laughs> Meanwhile, at the Hall of Justice, um, mm. uh, so Professor X's son forms a new mutant team in a uh, in a Way of X follow up series. I think we may have, well, obviously Celeste was out, and we already kind of knew some stuff's coming. I think we definitely knew this one was coming uh, after right. Way of X ended, but um the newest titles announced as a part of uh marvel's upcoming destiny of x era of the x-men line of books are, is uh legion of x by former x-men legacy x-force and way of x writer Cy spurrier and winter guard and star wars artist jan uh Bal Bazaldiwa. Uh, as a new team of heroes gets put together by professor x's uh omega level son mutant son legion who uh who must help uh protect krakor from any internal threats that it faces um uh as we see here the team consists of legion um who will host the team in a psychedelic mindscape we i don't know if we even talked about that in wait when a uh, way of x ended but that was a whole thing nightcrawler pixie juggernaut blindfold dr nemesis and more uh and it looks like the there's a return of something from spurgers x-men's legacy and x4 series uh, so yeah, there it is, and there is the um, the the splash page for for that, and it's coming out in April. Next up, alrighty. Next up, Marvel has confirmed that the X Men vote will return in 2022. Marvel's Twitter account tweeted a teaser image for the 2022 X-Men vote on New Year's Day. Marvel has not provided any further details beyond that quote polls open soon unquote the first annual apparently x-men vote took place in 2021 with fans casting their votes for who should be the final member of the then unrevealed new x-men roster uh this real world vote tied into how in universe the mutant citizens of krakoa voted for the first time on who should form the x-men roster and the team debuted during the hellfire gala event yeah, like they they had teased this, and I guess we're, I guess this is a thing. <laughs> we're gonna get annual votes on the X Men. Uh, I guess. Yeah, no one's gonna be signing crowbars. I don't think. Oh no. <laughs> That's you know, don't worry about it, folks. You'll get that joke at some point. Uh, Marvel announces new Miracle Man omnibus without the Gaiman and Buckingham issues. So yeah, um, so after Timeless number one that we talked about last week, um, and I believe we talked about this, that um, we may have hinted, I don't know if we actually talked about it, but Marvel has the license to Alan Moore's character, Miracle Man, now, and they're bringing him back this year. Uh, so because of that- Well, it's not Alan, well, actually it is partially Alan Moore's character. Yeah, because I think he was the original writer, yeah. Well, no, it was uh, it, it was uh, originally introduced by um, um, Nick Anglo or Mick Anglo, something like that. Was it okay? Because I've been seeing stuff that said it was, it was um, okay. Well, yeah, because because yeah, the the the, the character was uh, introduced by or well, created by this guy Mick or Nick Anglo. I can't my my memory is failing me. Sure, okay. but um, it was reintroduced by Alan Moore, and that's the character. That's the version of the character that really you know kind of dissected the superhero genre gotcha okay so and neil gaiman picked up the baton after right. uh uh what you'll call it after um uh, alan moore left right uh so him, stop and so gotcha so yeah so because they have the license now they're, they're making an omnibus on uh miracle man but it's not going to include the neil gaiman mark buckingham who was the artist stuff um and it also says here that uh it's going to include alan moore stuff uh who's writing shaped his character but due to disagreements with marvel and dc over the treatment of creators and handling of his work has publicly distanced himself from much of his back catalog most notably asking marvel to remove his name from miracle man reprints and refer to him only as quote unquote the original writer 
Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So if if you know about that character, then you probably already have the stuff. But uh, this article kind of goes on to, to um, talk about what is going to be in the uh, um, omnibus, but not necessarily when. So it's coming some some at some point. Next up. With Spider-Man uh, finally available in Marvel's Avengers video game and the knowledge that Square Enix and Crystal Dynamics are definitely still looking to add more to the title via DLC in 2022, the question now is who's next? Not quoting President Bartlett. So while there's no official definitive answer for that, a new report from the same person that previously leaked the fact that Christopher Judge would voice Black Panther before the official announcement seems to confirm that Jennifer Walters, a.k.a. She-Hulk, will soon be added to the Marvel-branded video game title. And she will be voiced in the game by Krizia Bajos. Or Bejos. Sure. And it makes sense given that She-Hulk is um, due to have a live-action series coming up this year also. So that, that would stand a reason uh, that this happens. Definitely. So, cool. I still have to go back to that sh to that to that video game. Uh, move right along. Snag the Spider-Man Three Dance in Destiny Two for free this week. So yes, folks, that dance for, from from uh, Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man Three, where that's as much maligned. Uh, Destiny Two has uh, basically put this in a whole bunch of. I mean, they you know it's a video game that's kind of MMO-ish, and there are emotes slash dances in it, and this is the one that's been there for a minute. That you can now get. Now, this article goes on to say that um, you can get it this week for free with Bright Death. Bright Death is the in game currency, but when I went to go look for it, it was selling for silver. And that was only a couple of days prior to this, um, art, to, to this uh, recording. And I mistakenly bought it thinking other ways. But you also get enough Bright Dust to uh, purchase this emote if that were the case. But again, as of a couple of days ago, I have not seen where this is the case, so I don't know if this article is slightly off, or I must have missed something when I was going through the stuff uh, looking for it. But hey, you can go out there and check for yourself, and you can do this, and you can have this dance as, a, as, a, as an emote <laughs> in your collection. Moving right along. Next year sees the release of Black Panther 2 with all manner of Black Panther projects from or licensed from Marvel Comics. One of those is going to be Protectors of Wakanda, a history and training manual for the Dora Milaje, uh, and a hardcover volume by the Blurred Girl founder Karama Home, scheduled for the 13th of September 2022 to be published by Becker and Meyer, or Mayer. Shout out to the Blurred Girl. She's been doing all. Uh, she's been putting in work. Not that she hasn't already, because she's she's been out there for, you know, doing things for for the culture, <laughs> as they say, uh, for quite a while. So, you have probably seen her uh, doing something, hosting something, you know. So you should definitely go check it out. She's good people. I don't know her personally, but she, I like the a lot of stuff she's done. So, shout out to her for this. Uh, Gargoyles news, uh, NECA offers a peek at upcoming toys for the entire clan. So yes, folks, if you're a fan of Gargoyles, that, uh, the Disney show, um, there are toys coming from, uh, from NECA. Is it NECA or NECA? I have no idea. Yeah. That is uh, an excellent question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting here like, huh? Like, I don't think I've ever heard that, um, out loud. But regardless, uh, we're gonna twilight this one. Um, while I'm trying to pull something, uh, but yeah, here the, there are toys. Uh, there's a what the heck just happened? Okay. Uh, there's a tweet to the toys, and uh, we don't have any, any um, any other images outside of um, outside of this one in this tweet. But like I said, they're out there. Or and they're coming at some point this uh, this year. It says early, sometime this year. It looks like it's going to be Demona, Bra Man that's it, Bronx, the Demona, um, Goliath, and probably all the rest of them. 
yeah, Goliath, Hudson, Brooklyn, Lexington, Broadway, Bronx, uh, and that's just Demona. It looks like, and they got some more figures coming in development. Next up. One moment, waiting for a Google search to pay off. Okay. Is Gargoyle streaming anywhere? Yes, it's on. It's on Disney Plus. Is it on Disney Plus? Mm-hmm. I think it's time for me to rewatch. Yeah, it totally is because I got it in my um my watch list. There it I've is. I've never seen it. I mean, I've it... never seen it. What? Yeah. Well, I take it back. Let me. I take that back. I've seen probably two episodes and not even fully. Because it was like kind of after my time, because that was like that was like nineties. Like, uh, now granted, I was still I was watching Ducktales and all the stuff, but when it came to that, I think when that came out, like I don't know, I was working or something. Yeah, I was about to say I was in college, right? And, and it's one of those things where you know you just channel surfing. And you're like, oh wow, that's actually really cool, and you have a pretty talented voice cast, which is oh, yeah. dominated by actors from Star Trek: The Next Generation. Yes, indeed. And yeah, that was the thing. I was like, oh, I don't know what this is, but uh, yeah, I do remember, um, yeah, that. But like I said, I never saw more than a couple of episodes. So and yeah, and that was different when I knew saw that it was on Disney Plus a while ago. I was like, yeah, I'm gonna have to uh, check this out. Yeah, that's definitely up for a rewatch for me. I gotta, I gotta queue that up on my Disney Plus. All right, mm-hmm. next up, Renegade Game Studios already has one successful Power Rangers franchise going. In Heroes of the Grid, and now they're tacking, tackling the world of deck building with the aptly titled Power Rangers deck building game. Like Heroes of the Grid, Renegade weaves the tra- franchise's more iconic elements into the game seamlessly, creating a deep and satisfying deck builder that delivers sound mechanics and fast paced gameplay to longtime board game players. For fans of the Power Ranger franchise, however, uh, it will deliver so much more, and no Power Rangers fan should miss out on all the fun. Okay. So, short short order, it's a Power Builders deck building game, and you know Rodicat's probably going to try to get it. <laughs> because it's Okay. Uh, speaking of Power Rangers, uh, the Power Rangers comics team are being shaken up uh, with recent solicitation information. Uh, I believe the cre- creative teams are going to be um, changing... So it says here on Christmas Eve, Boom Studios released their solicitations for March 2022. Um, and it looks like Ryan Parrott is not writing Mar- Mighty Morphin number 17. Uh, Parrott confirmed that he's stepping down from Mighty Morphin after uh, number 16, but he will be staying on Power Rangers, which is the other book, with plans for the Mo- uh, uh, Omega Rangers. The new writer for Mighty Morphin will be Matt Groom, who I'm, I, I've seen that name in places. Um, I think it was co-writing um that Ultraman one of those some of the Ultraman stuff, um and some of the stuff also. But anyway, with artist uh, Moises Hildago taking the reins, and Marco Renner will be taking over the art on Power Rangers, starting with number seventeen. So and yeah, confirmed that uh, Groom was working on that Ultraman stuff with Kyle Higgins. Um, uh, so yeah, there you go. Next. Next up, Dark Knights of Steel is turning DC's new Supergirl into another evil Kryptonian. At the end of the series' second issue, Zala Jor-El, sister to Kal-El, claimed retribution against King Jefferson, uh, a.k.a. Black Lightning, for the death of her father and killed Jefferson's son by flying him way up into the night sky, dropping him and letting gravity do the rest. Uh, Yeah, 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 that's that's, uh, interesting. (laughs) <laughs> so basically, Superman's new sister goes full injustice in DC's medieval series. Mm. I have not read any of this, and I think like Tim has a little bit because uh, like he had as a, as a click uh, between the last couple of issues. But I'm kind of curious about this, but I feel like it's kind of the same some some of the same Tom Taylor stuff with just with fantasy settings. I feel that's that's terrible to say because you know you don't want to just give yourself. Yeah, you stuff. don't want to reduce it to just exactly. that, you know. Exactly, and I don't want to do that. So I'm gonna definitely try to give it a little shot here. See what's see what's up with it. Next up, though, um, Superman. Wait, why do I have this in here twice? Um, what the hell's going on? Oh, okay, good. Now this is actually good. Alan Moore teaches a class on storytelling for BBC Maestro. 
Um, so it says here, lift up your quills and welcome one of the most gifted storytellers. Uh, his worlds and characters dazzle with their originality, and his stories are filled with energy and intrigue. Thief and the Vendetta, Watchmen, and the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, which I totally forgot that was his. Um, to name a few. The Maestro of Storytelling is here to inspire you to create your own magical wonderlands with uh, commitment to the craft of language, story, cast, setting, and more. I am honestly kind of curious about this course. I don't even know if I can uh, uh, apply to it because uh, it's in the BPC, but who knows? We'll see. And I got a VPN, but we'll see. Uh, mm. I, I know I saw somebody else who was like kind of very excited about this on Twitter, so... I don't know. I, I'm very curious about this. We'll see if that if it, if it gets taken. Last but not least, though. Wait, say that again. Last but not least, though. No, no, no. Before that, before that, because uh, you were talking about this, uh, you know, about trying to uh, 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 gain access to this. Yeah, because it's from the BBC. Uh, I'm presuming it's from the BBC, so I don't know if it's uh, if it's a uh, uh, con- you know gated by country or not. I don't think it is. But I haven't right. looked into it. I've not looked into it. Got it. Got it. I see what you mean. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I gotcha. I gotcha. It looks like it's a, it's a course that you have to subscribe to. Correct. Yeah. It is. It's like masterclass or 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 Udemy right. or any of those other courses. So. Exactly. Exactly. All right. All right. Last but not least. Uh. If you love Scotty Young's I Hate Fairyland, well, he does too, and he's bringing it back with not one but two new series. Uh, Scotty Young is returning to his creator-owned fairy tale parody, I Hate Fairyland, with a new ongoing series coming from Image Comics, as well as a digital first <coughs> anthology series with a print edition from a publisher to be named later, featuring him and some of his talented friends. Okay. Yeah. I... Honestly, didn't think they had left, but you know, I don't know. I know he kind of comes back and the uh, they kind of come back and forth to it, like other, other stuff. As long as he's still doing Strange Academy, that's all I care about at this point. <laughs> <laughs> not the you know, the, the, you know, the, not to take away from his other, his other dealings and his art and whatnot, but you know, Strange Academy, that's the joint. Y'all should be reading that. Yeah, right. as long as he sticks with that, that's what you know. That's what pays his bills, really. At this point, yeah, I guess. Well, I mean, he's got, he, I think he's still doing art for other stuff, but yeah, he, he's creator own stuff with other people that I think he might be still be doing outside of this. So, so yeah, that's it, folks, for the news. And that brings us to the end of this here podcast. Uh, let's get one last ad read in, shall we? Our last ad read of the night is for Wink, a personalized wine club. Wink is a world of wine delivered right to your door. From rosé to cabernet to torrente, Wink has over 100 styles of wine to discover. Ever try an orange wine? Wink connects you to a world of exclusive wines tailored to your taste and delivered directly to your door. Wink delivers four bottles of wine to you every month with free shipping. You can pick your own bottles or let Wink choose and match to your taste. It doesn't cost a thing to become a member, and you can skip or cancel anytime. And now the listeners of the Comic Book Chronicles can enjoy an exclusive discount of $20 off your first order. To place your first order with $20 off and to help keep our show free for you, go to our network website at cspn.us forward slash wink. That's cspn.us forward slash w-i-n-c. Wink wines through CSPN. Do it today. And I believe one Agent 70 before we push off has a, a toy corner. I did, or do actually. So uh, I was perusing the Target website uh, post Christmas because I don't know. I think I was uh, searching for uh, an item for probably a late Christmas gift. And what I found just out of curiosity after searching for Marvel Legends was that they had restocked these retro X-Men figures. Namely, I got the rogue retro X-Men figure right here that I'm holding up right now. And it's a pretty cool repaint of the original uh, X-Men 90s rogue that we got because um, it's a it's a slight redo because they did a little bit of a, a re-sculpt on the head to change her hair, dude, so that it's a little bit more poofy. And it's that poofy hair that we are all familiar with. So... 
Um, I'm holding it up here. I'm actually going to turn my uh, virtual background off just so that people can see it. It has a good looking figure. Right there. Right. The one difference that is, uh, the, well, the other difference that's important other than the head is that it's in, it includes uh, two different hands uh, which represent uh, Rogue pulling her glove off to use her mutant power. You know, one holding the extra glove and one being a bare hand. So it's actually a pretty cool uh, twist. It's not just a repaint, as it were. So it's kind of cool that they reissued it, you know, on this uh, retro backing. Um, I declined to get the Gambit one because I didn't necessarily need the 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 alternate head because uh, I didn't I didn't necessarily like the repaint of the legs. You know, it just didn't jive well with the, my sense of what the color scheme of the character should be. So, ultimately, I picked up the Rogue, and I'm glad to have done it. I'm glad that it restocked over at Target, because this initially was a fast sellout. Gotcha. So, so uh, if there is one lesson to, to, to leave everyone with before um, we sign off tonight is uh, sometimes you, it helps to be patient when it comes to these exclusive offerings of Marvel Legends figures. This is true. This is true. Um, yeah, and um, um, overblown Southern accent, not included. Right. <laughs> Sugar. Exactly. Uh, and with that, uh, we are going to um, depart this. Um, oh, we're still coming in under, under time. So... Um, I have been Rydicat. You can find me at Rydicats on Twitter. You can find me at News on Twitter. You can find me at CB Caps on Instagram. Uh, Agent underscore 70 on Twitter and Instagram. PCN underscore Dirt on Twitter. Pop Culture Net on Twitter. Pop Culture Network.com and all those umbrella sites therein. And of course, the Osiris that is ish. Uh, one Tim D O G G nine eight on Twitter. You can also find him at uh, CB Cron on Twitter, which is the Combo Chronicles Twitter account. Uh, you can also find him at the Click Nation on Twitter. That's V K L I Q N A T I O N. Um, you can also, but definitely find him over at comicbook.com where he's over there writing his face off. Uh, you can find this here podcast on the Coastal of the Podcast Network. That's CSPN.us. Do it today. Uh, you can also find us on your podcast brutal place of choice, whether it be Google Play, Apple iTunes, aka Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or the Coastal of the Podcast Network SoundCloud page. Make sure to hit like and subscribe. Yeah. You can also find this recording every Thursday night, 9.30 ish p.m. on uh, the YouTube channel of The Click Nation. That's youtube.com slash The Click Nation and twitch.tv slash comic book chronicles. Make sure to hit like, subscribe, and hit the notification button, as well as leave reviews on all our podcast uh, perusal places of choice and video uh, places of choice. Yeah, and speaking of the video, the, the beginning of this one might be a little bit silent, so I apologize about that because for some strange reason, the, there was, the button was muted and I did not do that, so I don't know what happened. But regardless, that's fine. It'll be fixed in post if it's necessary. If that didn't happen, don't worry about it. Uh, with that, uh, this has been the Comic Chronicles. Peace. Peace one. I love it when a plan comes together. <laughs>